Hello, Happy New Year, and thank you all for joining us today for the first AGSIW webinar of 2021. I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW. Today, we're marking the one-year anniversary of Sultan Haytham's ascension to the throne in Oman, and we truly have a stellar panel of experts joining us to examine and make sense of the changes over the past year and uh, tell us what else we can look forward to in this coming year. First, I'm happy to welcome Ambassador Mark Sievers, the former U.S. Ambassador to Oman, who is still residing in Muscat. Ambassador Sievers retired uh, from the Foreign Service on November 30th, 2019, having served um, as U.S. Ambassador to Oman from January 2016 through November 2019. Uh, he led the U.S. Embassy in Muscat during a turbulent period characterized by war in neighboring Yemen, sharp shifts in U.S. policy toward Iran, and friction among uh, Oman's Gulf neighbors. Also joining us from Oman is Fatima Larimi, the co-founder of the Media Center. She is an Omani journalist with over 12 years of experience in local and international media. She co-founded the Media Center in January 2018 uh, as an Oman-based information and news hub with a focus on local news reports and analysis. Previously, she was Reuters correspondent on Oman. Also joining us from Oman is Turki Balushi, the Oman correspondent at Bloomberg LP, and a communications consultant. He has worked for the, uh, for the last 10 years in local and international media and has founded an independent media platforms uh, such as uh, the first online newspaper on Oman and the podcast Asseka. Moderating the session today is Kristen smith Diwan, uh, my colleague and senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute. Among her many projects, uh, Kristen follows generational change in the Gulf Arab countries and particularly in Oman. Her analysis and writing can be found on our website, agsiw.org. Uh, my usual disclaimer before we start, uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website as soon as tomorrow. Uh, also a reminder to our audience, you are in listen-only mode, but you will be able to ask your questions through the Q&A function in Zoom, or you can also email us at info at agsw.org or tag us on Twitter at Gulf States. And with that, Kristen, over to you. Great. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you for that warm welcome. And thank you to all of our participants. Uh, it's fantastic to be with you all this morning. Um, we saw a year ago, yesterday, a smooth transition of power in Oman from the longtime ruler and founder of the Omani state, Sultan Qaboos, uh, to Sultan Haytham. And with this new ruler, um, he took steps to demonstrate the continuity of rule and connection to the historic leader. But since that time, we've of course seen him strike out in some distinctive ways, especially to address uh, the challenges that Oman is facing both in governance and uh, particularly in the economy. Um, at the six month period, we saw him issue uh, 28 royal decrees uh, delineating a reorganization of the government. And now at the one year mark, uh, we have uh, seen further evidence of these changes with the issuance of amendments to the basic law of Oman's constitution, which will further affect uh, governing institutions, uh, including at the, at the very height of, of power. Um, so during this time, of course, we, we could talk about other challenges. Uh, Sultan Haytham has faced, of course, the ramifications of the coronavirus pandemic, which is, uh, wreaking havoc really on the global economy and, and Oman hasn't been spared from that. Um, and we can talk about a lot of the regional challenges uh, that have taken place as well. Uh, the intensification at some points of the regional competition and, and tension with Iran, um, which has likewise uh, impacted the situation in neighboring Yemen. Um, more recently, we've had uh, the Abraham Accords and the, the striking out of, of new uh, relations between the UAE and Bahrain uh, with Israel. And most recently, of course, uh, the, the first steps towards Gulf reconciliation through the recent GCC summit. So all that is just to say that Sultan Haytham has had a lot on his plate in his first year uh, governing in Oman which means that we as well have a lot to discuss in this time. And I, I'm really thrilled then to have uh, such a distinguished and, and dynamic, young and dynamic two panel with me um, to, to take these on, on all these issues. Um, as Raymond mentioned, you can, those of us joining us, you can put your questions into the Q&A function. And um, let's get started then. Why don't we start right away with, I know the news that, that everyone's wondering about, which are these changes that were just announced and made to the basic law. I know that was announced yesterday and, and then some of the details, I guess the actual changes started coming out today. Um, what are you hearing about these challenges and, and what do you make of them? 
what do you think are the most, you know, the most significant coming out of that? So why don't we start, uh, Ambassador, with you, if you want to give us your, your quick reaction. And I'm really going to test y'all's analysis since this is just coming out immediately. <laughs> See how Sure. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm interested in hearing the views of uh, my Omani uh, co-panelists, but uh, uh, certainly uh, it, is a, it is a big change from the caboose era where there was uh, a lot of ambiguity about the succession process. There was this sort of uh, complex uh, uh, two-stage process where the ruling family council was to meet uh, and they had 72 hours to uh, reach consensus. If, if they uh, failed to do that, then it went over to a, a, uh, a much smaller council of, of senior officials, including judiciary and security and military uh, who would open the envelope uh, that Caboose uh, had famously left, uh, indicating his his preference. Um, in in fact, when uh, uh, the late Sultan passed away, uh, they they basically skipped the uh, the council and went to uh, opening the envelope, and uh, that, that made for a very very smooth transition. Um, to the point of of what happened uh, yesterday and today, though. Uh, instead of having this uncertainty that, you know, that it would be a senior male member over the age of 40 of the, uh, the Al-Sayed uh, royal family, but uh, that leaves uh, quite a few uh, potential candidates, uh, what uh, the main uh, 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 royal decree and then the basic law amendment uh, provides for uh, the establishment of a position of crown prince, uh, who will be uh, the eldest male uh, son of uh, uh, of the sult of the ruling sultan? So uh, that uh, clarifies uh, the process uh, very, very much, and it's it's very much more traditional uh, Gulf process than than uh, what had been in place in Oman. I'll stop there. Okay, great. Fatima, do you want to give us uh, your quick read on, on these changes to the basic law and what you think is uh, most significant or what struck you in looking them over? Um, sure, I just wanted to add it to what Ambassador said about uh, the age itself. Uh, what we see from the details of the royal decree that now, even if the, the crown prince is 21 years plus, he can be, become sultan, which is something means that the new sultan can be... <clears throat> as young as 21 or 22, uh, allows, uh, allowing uh, the possibility for a younger even uh, uh, leadership, which is something I think um, Oman would appreciate. Sorry. <coughs> uh, you know about my cold. <coughs> uh, but the other uh, interesting thing is also the focus on what exactly the economic uh, guidelines uh, for, in, in, in the constitution, what are the, the basic thing that Oman will be focusing on and will continue to be focusing on when it comes to its economy, uh, uh, when it comes to equality, uh, freedom of expression, we can see that there is more flexibility and more dynamic that's coming in, in, uh, in the basic law. Uh, this is something, again, I think will reflect positively on the economy. One other point, one last point uh, is um, that what we used to see of uncertainty uh, on who is going to be the successor has impacted partially the rating of, of the country when it comes to, uh, uh, to uh, international credit agencies. And because this vague uh, future has impacted uh, the willingness to invest or even to, to secure loans to the country. But now, if you do not have that, that will allow the country to have even more clearer, uh, better position when it comes to uh, uh, economic uh, and, and uh, credit ra uh, rating uh, internationally. And I'll leave it at that. Sure, that's certainly true that markets don't like uncertainty. <laughs> um, Turkey, do you wanna tell us your, your quick uh, view and reaction as you've been reading over these changes? Yeah, thank you uh, for having me in this session, actually. And maybe uh, the first thing I can talk about is uh, 
uh, I think the Yazan will be the Crown Prince in Oman. It's just we are waiting for a few days maybe to be really uh, officially announced. It's very clear in the new basic law of the constitution as it's uh, um, that the Yazan will be the first Crown Prince in history of Oman. The first time in the history, because in Oman tradition, political tradition, there was nothing, uh, uh, was nothing uh, uh, witnessed like that uh, having uh, appointing a crown prince. It always was based on something called shura within the family. The family is ruling, and especially in, in Al Said family. So this is very, uh, very uh, uh, maybe. Uh, uh, very specific and also very clear process for uh, succession in the future in Oman. So we'll, we'll, I think a few days we'll, uh, we will we are waiting for in a few days to be uh, the year than uh, the, the crown prince in Oman. So this is the first uh, impression about the new basic law, and there is also a few changes we are expecting in uh, Oman Council, which is Shura and and State uh, Council. And that means maybe there is uh, uh, changes could happen in the powers of uh, Shura Council, more uh, uh, power for a Shura and, and for its members uh, as well. And maybe there was there will be more accountability within the uh, government performance. This is just you know uh, the main uh, features, but we don't know still the details. But this is the big change, actually. It's a big change because I think uh, succession last year, uh, which also, uh, it's also now, it's already one year from, uh, from that date, it was always the questions about how secure is that and how also is uh, uh, mastery. You know, uh, this was always mentioned in the international media. It was always uh, a question, even with the domestic uh, uh, discussions in Oman. So I think this is one of the significant changes happening now in Oman. Within, wherever also there is another, uh, you know, there is also a discussion about that this change is happening in Arabic perspective. You know, the change is coming from up to down where, where there is no also participation in that change in the basic law or, or the constitution. But this is, I mean, now what we are seeing. Mm -hmm. Maybe before we, we step on from this topic, uh, since this is such a, a, a big change really uh, in the governing structure, I don't know if any of you want or all of you want to reflect a little bit on, on what this might mean kind of in a broader picture. I think Fatima already sort of started stepping into that, talking about that in the economy, but also just in terms of the, the shift in the ruling structure, having a crown prince, how will this affect the dynamics within the ruling family? I don't know, Ambassador, do you want to address that? Yeah, just off the top of my head, I mean, it, it does seem to be, as I, I, I noted earlier, uh, kind of more of a, a more traditional kind of uh, Gulf uh, royal family, uh, which was certainly when, when Qaboos was, was Sultan was, was very much not the case here. He didn't uh, uh, appoint a lot of royals to... to uh, key positions. He uh, uh, kept uh, his distance uh, by and large from uh, much of the royal family um, and, uh, uh, and had uh, a number of insiders who weren't royals at all who were, who were close to him because of his appreciation of their abilities or uh, the service to him. Um, but uh, it, it was a very different model than the rest of the Gulf. We don't know where this is going, but it does seem much more familiar and much more traditional, uh, if I may. Yeah. Of course, the only other state that has this sort of primogeniture where it goes to the eldest son is Bahrain. So it does give a little bit of a different dynamic, I think, when the rule is sort of centralized that way than just having it open to the broader ruling family. Any other thoughts um, on this point before we move on to other, other changes? Anything you're expecting in terms of the ruling dynamics? Or can you tell us maybe a little bit, uh, Turkey, can you just, you mentioned that you thought that uh, Diaz and then will, the eldest son will become um, the crown prince. Can you tell us just a little bit about him? I don't think he's very well known really outside of Oman. So yes, now it's very clear that Diaz uh, 
prob yeah, I mean, within days, he will be appointed as a crown prince. Uh, and the reason I have studied the political science in, in UK, and he is now appoint uh, he's appointed uh, in August as a minister of culture and, and, and sports and youth in Oman. And was not really, I mean, uh, I mean, was not seen a lot in, in, in public events here in Oman before uh, uh, maybe three years, but he's more uh, now, I mean, as a minister, but uh, also we have uh, to mention that he was also uh, in the UK, uh, Oman embassy in UK, uh, mm -hmm. so he has also diplomatic background and then he he came back to Oman and he was also working in the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs so he has that diplomatic uh, background and uh, and now he's working in the position his father uh, uh, Sultan uh, used to be in so mm -hmm. it seems he is also you know following the same routes that his father take before his father Sultan Haytham bin Tariq was uh, 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 in Ministry of Foreign Affairs for uh, several years, uh, and then he was under secretary, I think, uh, for several years. Uh, and then he went as he appointed as minister of culture and, and heritage. Uh, for, he was uh, for 20 years. So he's also, you know, he's uh, he's stepping the same, or he's following the same uh, routes, he, or uh, maybe the path his father uh, spent. So. It's very clear that his, uh, the Sultan Haytham is preparing him now uh, for the new position mm -hmm. that will be announced very soon. Great, thank you very much. Chris, uh, just, just one comment on that point. Um, I noticed I was already retired, so I wasn't in the, the meeting, but uh, when Secretary Pompeo came here to pay condolences at the very end of the, the more official mourning period, uh, it was very noteworthy that Sultan Haitham included uh, his son uh, in that meeting. And I, I think he was uh, present in, in, in several of the other uh, uh, senior meetings in that, in that early period uh, before he was made uh, Minister of Culture. So that seemed like an early indication that his father was, had big plans for him, but uh, just an observation. Thank you. Well, let's um, move on there. This is only, you know, the latest of, of a number of, of huge changes that have taken place in the first year. I, we're going to have the chance to, to delve more in detail into each of them. But I thought first I would just give each of you an opportunity to, to maybe mention one thing that, that really struck you as the most significant step that has been taken by the Sultan in this uh, initial year. Um, Fatima, do you want to start us off? Um, sure. Um, I think uh, the main thing that Oman have seen when it comes to economy um, is approving the midterm fiscal plan uh, Tawazun and the other associated ch changes, um, uh, including uh, the restructuring of the government, uh, uh, the government uh, shrinking the number of uh, government agencies and letting go a lot of uh, long serving uh, uh, officials. Uh, in the government, which in a way um, is fulfilling what the Sultan has mentioned more than once in his speeches during the year that he is trying to restructure the government, have better governance on uh, the state uh, uh, over the state on the enterprises uh, and to best direct the, the financial resources of the country. And I think that is the major change. Despite what, um, how harsh some of the measures might seem, uh, especially under Tawazun, the midterm uh, fiscal plan, but I think it, the, these measures will be very essential, very important to at least get Oman uh, uh, in a higher um, uh, rating place where it is at least an investment grade uh, country, not as it's, uh, it is currently uh, suffering from lower uh, um, uh, rating, uh, very high debt, and uh, of course, uh, the impact of the oil prices. This is, the, I think, summarizing the main uh, changes that we've seen in 2020. Great, thank you. Uh, Turkey, would you like to tell us what, what struck you as most uh, significant? Well, yes, this is the, the, the program of uh, Tawazun, called Tawazun, or uh, Financial Balancing Program, which has been implemented already, was, I think, one of the harsh uh, uh, 
I mean, economic program that's being uh, started in Oman this year, and especially when Oman uh, decided to take uh, the subsidy for electricity and water, and this is, I think, very connected to uh, citizen directly because it's affect their income and how much they are paying now for the for this. Uh, I think this is one of the harsh steps the government has taken and people were talking about this and criticizing this step very clearly and i think one of the main challenges now the government will face is the population of Oman is 46 of its its youngest i mean it's it's young population and people are mainly uh, uh, you know looking for a job uh, youth are looking for jobs in Oman and economic is suffering because of you know, uh, oil price and also pandemic now hits Oman strongly. So I think this is one of the one one of the biggest challenges now it's Sultan Haytham is facing. And and uh, as much as government is trying, also have tried this uh, Sultan Haytham tried to restructure the government and administrate uh, and the state uh, administration I, uh, units. I think it's still challenging to uh, uh, revive for economy. It's, it's the hardest time uh, for Oman to, uh, you know, to, 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 to uh, make the private sector more, uh, maybe, um, you know, able to create jobs. Uh, and I think this will, uh, will be uh, clear by this year because still pandemic is is uh, impacting the economies and event the oil price is getting higher i think the challenge is, is it's not easy to uh, to um, you know to to cross all these challenges that Roman were facing last 5 or 6 years within just few months and and i think this is the biggest challenge that sultan haytham Mutarak is facing now in Oman and maybe focusing more uh, to uh, see the new maybe uh, to open new new doors to bring uh, uh, investment and also uh, uh, giving uh, economy uh, maybe bringing new laws for foreign investment and for private sector as well. Mm -hmm. Well, we're definitely going to delve uh, more deeply into those uh, challenges of both government reorganization and, and balancing in the economy. Well, let's hear what Ambassador Sievers also sees as the most significant kind of first change this first year. Certainly, I, I concur. Uh, uh, Sultan Haitham has clearly made the economy uh, the center of, of his uh, uh, of his rule uh, during this period, and uh, for good reasons, uh, the, the stresses were were very great because of uh, the collapse of oil prices uh, shortly after he uh, uh, assumed rule, and and also the impact of the pandemic. Um, you know, sort of all came together at the same time, and uh, and uh, and as Fatima mentioned, uh, the very the high level of debt. So there's been uh, a great deal of effort to uh, reduce expenditures and to also on the revenue side. And so we'll, we'll see the value added tax uh, uh, come into uh, effect in April. Um, that's something that was a GCC wide agreement, but Oman had been uh, deferring implementation and uh, they, they, they moved it up uh, uh, so that it will start in April. There is um, been an announcement that there will be an income tax for the first time on on high earners, uh, although it's not clear exactly what the definition of high earners uh, will be, and there's a lot of uh, ambiguity around this. But it's uh, uh, for the Gulf, uh, uh, kind of a radical idea. Uh, uh, so uh, so those things as well on the, on the revenue side, and and I fully agree. There's uh, a, a very high priority. Uh, attached to attracting foreign investment. And uh, I don't know the details, but I know the, the head of the U.S. Uh, Export-Import Bank was just here and uh, received, uh, maybe Fatima knows more about this than I do. I haven't been able to get a readout yet, but um, that seemed to be a, kind of an initiative uh, from uh, the outgoing Trump administration. But I would think there's a fair chance that uh, the president-elect Biden will continue that uh, when he when his team comes into office. Um, also on, on on foreign affairs, 
uh, the, there's been a continuity in the sense that Sultan Haitham announced early on that he would adhere to the broad outlines of Sultan Qaboos's foreign policy. Um, but there's definitely a, a change in emphasis. And I think, you know, in my time as ambassador, a lot of people commented to me that um, the economy was already facing some difficulties in uh, 2016, 2017, um, but that uh, Caboose uh, really wasn't all that interested in economics and what he cared about was national security and, and foreign policy and Oman's role in the world stage. And uh, I think that even though uh, Sultan Haitham comes from uh, at least part of his background, his prior career was in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, that he is much more focused on the economy uh, and uh, much less on uh, uh, on some of the uh, uh, diplomatic initiatives that, that seem to uh, uh, capture uh, Caboose's uh, imagination. Well, let's... Um... Everyone seems definitely to, to, to agree on the focus on the economy and the urgency of, of those changes. So let's delve a little bit deeper into that. Um, Atma, if I have my numbers right, Oman has experienced in this period of coronavirus at least like a 10% contraction, which is really one of the largest uh, in the Middle East um, uh, and even in emerging markets. So, so quite serious implications. Uh, of course, all the countries are experiencing this, but for Oman, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, and especially when we look at Oman's um, um, uh, international debt and, and need for external financing, that has also been uh, increasing, uh, almost doubling, I believe. So, so it is a difficult economic situation. Um, Turkey already mentioned uh, some of the policies that have been taken to increase revenues that are, are was somewhat um, unpopular. Um, how is uh, the Sultan kind of uh, dealing with this overall crisis, but also with uh, trying to balance, I guess, uh, uh, demands on the public and from different constituencies, I guess, uh, and meeting these challenges, these economic challenges? Yeah, okay, I, think I think merging. Oh, yeah, sorry, Fatima. Turkey, just one minute. Let me let Fatima take the initial. Okay, um, I, I think uh, it, it is highlighted in the current uh, five-year plan. Uh, the focus itself, we can see that uh, there isn't much focus now on tourism, for example, as one of the lead sectors. Uh, and even the, the forecast for the participation of tourism is lower, actually, uh, than what has been uh, forecasted for the previous five-year plan. But we have see we see that education has came forward, which is something again the Sultan has focused on on his speeches uh, when it comes to education. Now the economic challenges will continue. I think that's why Tawazun has been revised. The first draft of um, this fiscal plan was presented to the Sultan in February 2020, which was before the actual impact of the COVID hit the economy. A uh, few months in, within uh, in, into uh, the pandemic, uh, the, the plan itself was revised with more drastic and deeper uh, measures uh, uh, in effect. And that includes uh, whether uh, uh, the proposal to introduce uh, income tax on high er earner uh, or also expanding the, the, the list of, uh, of the excess tax uh, and restructuring uh, the, the subsidy uh, not just for electricity and water, but also for uh, wastewater and uh, uh, um, the municipality waste uh, management. So these are also more things that he will be taking into account. Another uh, challenge when it comes to, to debt, uh, because the cost of debt in Oman, it's very, very high due to its uh, the, the situation of its economy. That's why it uh, debt represents the third largest spending in 2021 budget when with 1.2 billion Omani real. Um, and only this year, Oman, according to a recent re uh, report by Reuters, um, only this year Oman will have to, to pay back almost 10 billion US dollars. So for that, the country will have to start raising a lot of funds, but without boosting or enhancing or making better on its credit rating, the cost of uh, borrowing will remain high. 
And there is only so much they can do when it comes to local liquidity and withdrawing from local uh, deposits. Uh, yes, as of this year, they will be getting between 1.2 to 1.4 billion Omani riyals from uh, the newly established uh, investment authority, which is the sovereign uh, investment uh, body uh, that supervises all, almost uh, all the state-owned enterprises. But again, this will not be enough to, to finance the debt. So we expect more measures to be taken um, to, to, to boost the economy, uh, if not cut when it, uh, from expenditure. Because there is also a worry that if you keep cutting a lot, you will end up losing um, the talents that you have. People will be demoralized to, to participate in the economy. So what you can do is boost the economy using other measures. And I think this comes to uh, the, the promise to work in regulations or further regulations. We still have certain laws are still bending to be approved. One is the public debt uh, law, one is the labor law that has been dragging for years now. So this will be very important for the economy to open up to at least help increasing revenues from other sectors besides uh, oil and gas. Maybe if I can just follow up with a question from the audience. We have a question from Justin Alexander uh, asking about that personal income tax that was mentioned earlier. Um, do you believe it will really be implemented next year? And also uh, when we look at this financial situation, what are the chances of Oman securing concessional financing from Gulf allies or China or others? Okay, when it comes to the income tax, I think one of the main things about following this fiscal plan is to actually stick to it. Because one of the takes on Oman's, how, how procedures and how things happen in the past is that Oman would promise some, to do something, but it would take longer time uh, or, or time frame to, to implement that, uh, that procedure or that measure. So the key thing is to actually stick to it. So I believe it will happen, uh, uh, but it will be at a very, um, the, re the range itself uh, of, uh, of that, that category that will uh, be under this uh, uh, tax will be very minimum in the first year. And it will expand in the following uh, uh, or the or, or or within two years. So I think this will 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 happen. Um, when it comes to the other part about uh, receiving uh, uh, support from from allies, um, I don't think Oman's position has changed when it comes to how do we receive uh, support when it comes as a loan as um, uh, um, as. Uh, an investment, uh, uh, some would like to, to call it. I think Oman's uh, terms remain the same. This help, uh, this support, whether it's a deposit, whether it's a loan, whether it's an investment, it should not have any political terms attached to it. Oman is a proud country with a very independent uh, political will, and they always like to, to remain the same. So we might receive, we might see uh, some investments or uh, deposits coming from allies to, to the central bank at least, or uh, direct investments based on, uh, on uh, diplomatic relations. Uh, and that's why we've seen uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs meeting with the American officials and had also meet, uh, discussions with other officials to do with economy uh, and his focus on um, economic diplomacy, uh, for at least that's what we've seen. Uh, but without having any impact on Oman's independent political will. Well, why don't, uh, just to that point, because I know the question is going to come up about the relation of Oman with its neighbors. Uh, I'm wondering, Ambassador Sievers, if, if you agree with that point that Fatima made, that the Oman will really try to uh, remain sort of independent from those kinds of uh, political demands um, and if they'll be able to, to succeed in that. And, and just more generally, how have you seen uh, Oman's relations with the, particularly the Gulf neighbors changing uh, under Sultan Haytham, if at all? Yes, I, I fully agree with Fatima. I mean, certainly that's a, a you know, a, a very high priority here is maintaining the independence of uh, Omani policy and uh, maintaining 
uh, Oman's uh, uh, ability to uh, uh, have its own uh, course in, in its relations with, uh, with the neighbors, and that, that includes Iran, obviously. Um, I think there's been an effort, uh, you know, um, in the last years of Sultan Qaboos's reign, there was a fair amount of tension uh, off and on with uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE over the Yemen war primarily. Um, I think that's, uh, there's, uh, I think Sultan Haitham is, is trying to uh, reduce those tensions and that's consistent with the uh, the broader pattern of rapprochement uh, within the, the GCC and the, the end of the, the Qatar rift, uh, at least in its uh, current incarnation, we'll see what happens in the future. Um, that has very much uh, been a, an Omani uh, goal, uh, although the Kuwait took the lead in, in trying to mediate between uh, the Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Bahrain, and, and Egypt and, and the Qataris, um, o Oman was, was very supportive of Kuwaiti efforts behind the scenes uh, and also maintained its own uh, dialogue with, with Qatar, uh, which uh, has led to, I think, increased economic ties and, uh, between Oman and, and Qatar. Uh, although, as far as I know, uh, the UAE is still the largest uh, source of direct foreign investment here. So despite some political differences, uh, Economic ties uh, are very strong, but I, I fully agree uh, that they will want to, uh, the Omanis will be very careful uh, to maintain their, their political independence, uh, even uh, if uh, they need uh, some assistance or would, would like some support from uh, some of the, uh, the wealthier Gulf states. Well, since you've brought up the issue of uh, reconciliation, if I can turn one more question back to Fatima before we move down to Turkey as well. Um, do you think this reconciliation then, I think politically, uh, probably we can all agree that, that the greater Gulf reconciliation is, is definitely in a direction that, that, that Oman would be very favorable about and, and is very happy with. Um, but do you think this will pose any actually economic challenges to Oman? Um, to, in some ways it's actually benefited uh, from the um, you know, kind of boycott of, of Qatar uh, particular and, and air flights, um, is this a concern or, or do you, how do you see that kind of balancing out on the economic side? Um, I think, yes, Oman has benefited when it comes to either uh, flights or even uh, shipping lines uh, coming to uh, Omani ports um, as an alternative. Um, when it comes to the ports, I think even with the reconciliation, the, the impact will be minimal, minimal on the Omani ports for another factor, which is whatever tension is happening over the Strait of Hormuz. So Oman has an alternative outside the Strait of Hormuz, which gives it also uh, a good uh, edge. And during the, the 2020, we've seen more direct uh, lines, uh, shipping lines going from Omani ports to fulfill local needs, but I think this can be expanded uh, in, in the future. When it comes to uh, um, airlines, uh, airline services, um, we recently have seen uh, a quote sharing, sharing agreement between Oman Air and Qatar Airways. I think over this year and maybe perhaps the next year, due to the COVID impact on the aviation sector, and especially in the region, I think they will stick together, uh, even temporarily, um, after the aviation sector is well revived. Uh, after uh, following the, the, the pandemic, I think then Oman will have to compete with what they used to compete uh, before uh, the boycott or the crisis in 2017. Uh, so, uh, but I think if they can work out a way to expand uh, their operations to have even um, better services and lines uh, and a restructure of their cur current uh, aviation plan, I think Oman can start competing, but it will be very difficult during this year or the following to compete with each other. Right. Right. Yeah. This whole question of, of competition, uh, both in airlines and we could talk about ports is, is definitely going to become more of an issue across the Gulf uh, to see if there's a potential for, for cooperation or any kind of coordination there, but there's definitely a, a lot of Gulf countries moving in these, these same areas. 
True. Um, we have a question um, from Sagar al um, asking uh, what change in, in your opinion would be the most fundamental or transforming? Um, I know Turkey, you've been looking, you're, you're free to open, answer that question however you like, but I know you've also been looking more closely at the, the restructuring of the government. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the, in more depth about the changes that are taking place uh, there in the government? So I think, yeah, restructuring government and, uh, you know, uh, was one of the uh, important step uh, Sultan Haytham had taken in the last uh, three uh, months. And also these changes, I think, was uh, clearly taken uh, to, uh, you know, reduce spending in the government and making uh, decisions more centralized. So the last uh, August, there was uh, more than 28 royal decrees from Sultan Haytham and Tarak, and it was more significant uh, government recognitions uh, uh, since the last uh, 50 years, I think. He started removing more than five governmental councils and merging more than 10 ministries. And also these uh, changes was uh, directly impacting uh, not only ministers, also the authorities was out of the ministers council. There was few uh, councils also out of the, uh, 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 the cabinet. So I think he was also uh, uh, aiming to control the policy directions and, and within the government, because there was, uh, I think, different policy direction within the government. So there was also conflicts uh, in many decisions and that's affect directly uh, the economic policies and also many other po investment policies as well and many other uh, 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 policies in the government. So I think this was one of the uh, main reforming within the uh, the government uh, structure and organizational organizational structure. So this was uh, aiming as well to uh, to make less spending within uh, the government and try to focus more on uh, the uh, the new authority, which has been also merged two funds uh, in Oman, the state funds, two state funds has been merged. I think focusing more in uh, the state companies and then merging uh, many councils that were also playing the role on making the policy of investment and also the policy uh, directions within the government. What do you see really is the, the, the major intent, I mean, the overall picture of what, what they're trying to achieve with all these uh, consolidations? Um, I think making ma making policies more centralized within the government and also there was many conflict within the ministries, you know, there was different ministry having the same similar, maybe uh, um, uh, similar uh, responsibilities within uh, these uh, ministries. I think this was also uh, one of the challenges that the government was facing and this uh, restructuring gives more flexibility for a government to uh, work in maybe smooth directions uh, in making policies and working also more in um, changing maybe the, the also in the future the these policies to keep uh, you know the the government uh, more flexible mm -hmm. Um, I, we have a question, maybe staying with you, Turkey, um, from Ahmed al Um Will the current economic and financial crisis facing Oman drive the introduction of political reforms, or will it, on the contrary, depress it? Um, and a, just kind of follow-up question, can economic reforms be sustained without political reforms? So do you think that these... Um, changes in government and the, the challenges that Fatma spoke about and the new demands there are going to impact uh, further bodies such this as the Council of Oman. <laughs> this is a very critical question as I was talking uh, in, the, in the beginning that, you know, change is happening in the Gulf countries from up to down and still there is no, uh, uh, you know, uh, participation, you know, more participation from 
people in making uh, policy and, and also uh, uh, political participation. So, so that's uh, mainly affecting somehow. So if we are looking more now uh, for the uh, taxes that are coming in Oman, the uh, VAT tax will be implementing in, by April. And there is also income higher, uh, income uh, earner uh, tax will coming maybe by 2022. So this means Oman is going to be more, you know, tax uh, state. So does that mean Oman is need to be participating more in public decisions in, in, the, in the state in the future? So this is very, uh, you know, critical question because actually this is now what people are thinking about and they are talking about the, the they are raising question about should uh, also uh, there will uh, should be more participation in uh, shura and also there will be more accountability and uh, more uh, maybe uh, change in, in the laws that gives maybe also civil society participations in making policy in the, within the state. So these are actually very connected uh, uh, links between political reforming and also political reforming because if we are just you know if the state is just thinking in accountant perspective you know that they are they are uh, aiming to make less uh, uh, debt or they are uh, uh, looking to maybe just uh, you know uh, survive financially i think this is uh, it's not just accountant perspective it's or should be very well uh, structure reforming, and that's actually include political reforming. So this is what people are looking now for, and, and I think that's uh, maybe, I mean, that's, we could see that in these uh, new laws that are coming, uh, especially uh, Oman Council laws, uh, uh, and yeah, we, we, we don't know still what's the details, but this is also the questions that's being raised now in Oman. Yeah, I don't know, Fatima, if you want to uh, address that either from the point of view of what the, any changes in the council might might impact on, uh, on actually the economic program as well, not just the political program. Um, I know that'd be kind of speculative at this point. Um, or also just to speak to how the government has been balancing kind of these demands um, across different sectors kind of in society. I mean, obviously there's a lot more uh, cost now uh, with a lot of the subsidies being cost and new taxes, um, how is that being uh, handled and managed to show that there's like a shared burden in Oman? Um, yeah, um, what we've seen over the last 12 uh, months is, first of all, we what we, we came to know, it was not made public, uh, public, but we came to know that there has been drastic cuts when it comes to the spendings of the royal palaces. So he started... Uh, with, with himself and the, the royal palaces to start cutting there. Following that, we, we've seen him uh, retiring the long-serving uh, advisors who used to, be the, used to be the close entourage to late Sultan Qaboos. Um, and then he started with those who served for, again, 30-plus uh, years, uh, pushing them out for, for retire, uh, retirement. Without the expensive... Uh, end of service uh, uh, allowance that they used to get before that. Yes, we've seen in the last month the, the restructure of the subsidy, but following that, we, we got to know just at the end of, the, of uh, December, uh, the new uh, regulations by the Ministry of Finance to uh, either uh, completely cancel or cut the allow allowances for uh, uh, all uh, employees, including the top officials, that includes ministers and under secretaries, which has given the people a certain, uh, I don't want to use the, the word blue, but they, they were somehow, they felt that the, the burden is being shared also by others. And this cuts comes into uh, 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 effect uh, again in, in April. Uh, just a few days ago, only uh, on, on Thursday, uh, the state-owned enterprises that has multiplied over uh, the last uh, five-year plan, the state, uh, the, the Oman's uh, Investment Authority had a meeting with the CEOs and the board members informing them that, again, all the executives, directors, CEOs will be also getting cuts. Uh, 
Uh, this includes uh, allowances, uh, benefits that they get, used to get. Again, it shows that um, not only one segment of the society is getting is feeling the burn and the heat of these uh, changes. These changes on on the state-owned enterprises will also come into effect as of April. So I think as long uh, there is always a way, a balancing act between uh, we do not only uh, 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 burden one segment of the society against the other, I think there will be at least somehow people will start feeling that this is impacting all of us. This will leave one main point, uh, the public feel that it is important, which is accountability. The question of who made who, who resulted into the Omani economy to reach to this current uh, stage of burden? Uh, who are the people who benefited over the last decade or so uh, while the, the, the country was drowning uh, steeper and steeper in debt? Uh, uh, so, and, and, they, and they want to see someone held accountable. Uh, we've heard from the Sultan that it is about going to be about ac accountability, uh, integrity, and I think people are expecting to see someone uh, at least held accountable for what they've done publicly. Uh, whether this is going to happen or not, to be honest, I doubt it because we haven't seen the Sultan putting a lot of these things that impact the people, um, uh, especially the high, higher people, higher uh, officials, uh, we don't see these things are are happening in public, but behind closed doors. Uh, but he makes sure that they are held accountable. Uh, so I think the time will only uh, tell if this will see uh, will happen or not. But he will have to keep balancing uh, these different changes. When it comes to Oman Council, if they are given the authority to actually approve laws, that was going to be something huge. Because currently, uh, the, uh, the Council of Oman with its two chamber, Ashura, which is elected by the public, and uh, uh, the State Council, which is appointed by the Sultan, uh, they currently, they give their opinion on draft laws that is uh, transferred to them or passed to them from the government, which is the cabinet. But we do not see them actually approving these laws. If we see this change, this is a huge step to, towards public participation and social participation in the policy making uh, process in the country. Um, we would follow up question since you, you focus on the issue of accountability, something we didn't address uh, at the top of the program. Uh, I know with the uh, new changes in the basic law, they're creating a new council. Is that right? That is going to be uh, observing and, and uh, uh, all of the, the actions of the, the government and performance of the government. So basically a monitoring body for that. Um, I wanted to ask uh, all of you um, about the ability of this council to, to have, uh, you know, impose greater accountability. And also just thinking together with the other changes. And, and we have a question actually from Jassim Hussein in, in Bahrain. Do you think Oman will follow Bahrain's model of naming the Crown Prince as prime minister? Uh, and of course, or we could just talk about through this council maybe establishing, uh, it, say, it seems a bit almost like a prime minister position, uh, potentially. So do you think that's a move that uh, Oman might make to work towards having a prime minister? I don't know, Ambassador, if you have any thoughts about that. Well, currently the, the Sultan is, is prime minister. Um, Independent prime when, minister. When Kabus was uh, alive and, and well, he, uh, was also, uh, at least in, in theory, Minister of Defense, Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, Minister of uh, Finance, and I believe the, the head of the Central Bank. Um, those were, were not actual uh, uh, policy uh, positions in, in that he, he didn't really fill those roles, uh, but he, he clearly dominated uh, all the key sectors himself. Um, I see, uh, uh, you know, clearly Sultan Haitham has, has moved away from that kind of model. Uh, one of the, the obvious changes is, uh, although he still is prime minister, the um, uh, ministers of foreign, the minister of foreign affairs is, it actually has the title of minister 
uh, of foreign affairs. His predecessor, uh, uh, Yusuf Ben Alawi, was always the minister responsible for foreign affairs. I, I think it's the same with uh, with finance, um, and um, and uh, they've largely, uh, hit, you know, his his brother uh, uh, Said Shahab is now uh, the deputy prime minister for defense affairs, and there currently isn't a, a minister of defense or a, a secretary general at the Ministry of Defense. Um, so those are those are. Uh, changes, I think, uh, as part of this whole ration, rationalization and consolidation of, of power. But exactly what he's thinking about uh, in terms of uh, uh, the position of prime minister, I, I really don't know. Turkey, do you want to address that or at least just the changes as well uh, for the new yeah. council that's been announced? Well, it's, you know, it's mentioned the new, uh, the basic law, which is uh, the uh, also the old one and the new one, actually, that Sultan can uh, appoint a prime minister. And actually, in the history, his, his father, Tariq uh, bin Taymur, has, was the first prime minister in Oman during uh, Sultan Qaboos ruling just for two years. Um, and then he left that position. And then, well, then uh, Sultan uh, Qaboos was uh, in that position uh, last uh, 80, uh, sorry, 48 years. Then... Yes, I think this could be also one of the biggest change that could, you know, uh, divide the authorities uh, of Sultan and also the government and make the government more accountable, you know, by Shura Council, if there is more, uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, power for the Shura Council or Oman Council. So appointing prime minister could be a very significant change in Oman. And, and I think people were also rising uh, this uh, uh, you know topic again and again and it might also give the government uh, or for people and media and Shura Council space to be direct and criticizing and accountability and also focusing more in in observing and uh, also uh, seeing how the government can perform performance more so you know that Sultan has also uh, a big respect from people and they don't, you know, they, they want to uh, to have maybe a, a executive person who is uh, heading the government and to be uh, uh, on position that could be uh, asked and also um, uh, could be could also be questioned by a Shura Council or, or by media, I think. This could be a very big change, but we are not sure if this, that will, will happen or not. We've done a lot of domestic policy, which is great. I love that. Um, but let's turn a little bit more to, to some more issues on foreign policy. Um, uh, just to launch us, we'll let a, a question launch us. Uh, Jacob Slawek um, is asking about uh, the normalization that's happening across the region with Israel and, and whether that's a priority for Oman. Uh, if not, what would be the reasons for that? Ambassador, do you want to start us? Sure, let me start. Um, it, it, it seems that uh, it, it really isn't a priority for Oman. I think that uh, they were uh, um, pretty clear in, in stating their support for uh, the Abraham Accords when it was uh, just UAE and, and Bahrain. Uh, um, I think they've also uh, indicated support for uh, normalization with with Sudan and Morocco, but but it hasn't been as high profile an issue as as it is with uh, some of the other Gulf states uh, uh, here. Uh, at the same time, uh, they balanced that with uh, repeated public reference to Oman's support for uh, Palestinian Authority, for a two state solution, for uh, uh, um, resumed negotiations, uh, and so forth. So. Oman has had a, a balanced position uh, uh, in support of the normalization, but also uh, setting itself in, in a, uh, a more neutral uh, uh, position, which is, I think, where, where Oman usually likes to be. Um, I, don't, uh, I didn't really get the sense that there was a, a lot of pressure from the U.S. I know that the Trump administration certainly would have liked Oman to join uh, but I think it was made made clear, uh, at least that's my sense, uh, uh, very early on that uh, that they weren't uh, going to be part of this, uh, at least at this stage. 
Uh, all of that said, Oman uh, maintains uh, uh, channels uh, to Israel, um, and uh, it, it, there are uh, uh, opportunities uh, here for uh, Israeli businesses and, and so forth. I don't think that's a secret, um, yeah, although kind of quietly and uh, uh, without fanfare. Um, and so uh, there is a, a very nuanced uh, approach to this. You, could, you have the uh, Middle East Desalination Research Center, uh, MEDRIC, which uh, uh, has a board of directors that includes uh, the Director General of uh, uh, the Middle East Department of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs is on that board. Um, so there, there are a number of different channels and, and connections, uh, but it doesn't appear to me, and in fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they've made a decision that uh, uh, that they don't want to, uh, to join this process, at, at least at this time. Uh, Fatima, just quickly, do you see any sort of increased outreach or desire for more investment from, from Israel? Is that something that's on the agenda? Uh, we had one question from the audience related to that. Okay. Um, I don't think it will be welcomed um, by the public and uh, in Oman, which is something is not only from the Omani public. And there is always a gap or the difference between how the public feel about having relations with Israel and what is the political uh, uh, agenda or how uh, diplomacy works. Um, and I think this gap will continue uh, even, even if it happens and uh, the government normalizes relations with Israel, I think the public will also will remain to have its reservations on having uh, dealings uh, or investments uh, from uh, Israel. And I think it will, we will have to see how actually the relations of Israel with other countries who normalized the relations with Israel, um, are they actually investing in these countries? Uh, or are they only uh, coming as tourists uh, uh, or, or just to, to, to explore? Um, so far, we have not seen uh, any announcements from any Israeli party that they are investing in whether it's the UAE, Bahrain, uh, Morocco, Sudan, etc. cetera. Uh, so I, I don't think uh, this is something in the... In the a near future uh, that we're going to see, uh, but only God knows if it's actually we are actually going to reach an agreement between Palestinians with their rights to have their own state, uh, a fair state, um, and, and to have the, the two states uh, coexist. Thank you. Um, we had a question which I'm having trouble finding now in the in the box here. But it was about uh, religion and, and sort of the Abadi religion and, and the role that it's playing under the new Sultan. Uh, I, I bring that up in this context because I know that the um, Mufti had quite prominently kind of spoken out uh, against further normalization uh, in Oman. So I don't know, Turkey, if you want to speak to that about uh, any adjustment and and sort of how the Sultan is approaching uh, religion and state, or, or if you just want to comment on the Mufti himself and his role. Well, there's no, yeah, there is no like, uh, you know, specific changes happening on that officially, like, you know, but we have seen posters uh, on social media, especially like uh, the page of uh, the Grand Mufti in Oman was commenting really very controversial political uh, movement happening in the region and also uh, especially in the Gulf in the region, I think uh, uh, he was commenting about different political uh, movements, and I think uh, you know there is no very clear signs that this is also representing official, uh, you know, uh, uh, views. He's Grand Mufti. He's appointed by. Uh, I mean, he's uh, he's officially, you know, uh, Grand Mufti, but. Does that also reflect the state point of view? Um, there is no like, you know, clear, uh, clear uh, view about that. But I think he's also maybe having uh, or taking a step in that space, which is a bit different now in, in under uh, uh, Sultan Haytham and Tarak. He's maybe taking that 
you know, space that he can test water to, to, to be more, uh, you know, in, in, I mean, to, to give more uh, uh, open opinion in his, you know, point of view about these uh, political, uh, uh, you know, situations happening in the region. I, I, don't, I don't think this is, um, there is no like, you know, official statement that this is uh, official also point of view. And there is, I was talking to uh, officials in the government and, you know, it's, it's not clear within where this is uh, official, you know, uh, line that government is uh, pushing him to, to, to comment about or not. There is nothing right. yeah, uh, sure about that. Okay. Well, if, I can gonna... just, if I can just add something to, to what Turkey just mentioned. Um, uh, about uh, uh, the Grand Mufti's presence, we've seen him actually more uh, uh, presence on present on social media with his statements on different controversial uh, 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 um, um, phenomena or uh, steps in, in the region. Uh, and I think his presence and whatever statements he was putting on his social media account as a Grand Mufti, it helped a lot channel the feelings of the public. Because uh, earlier, some of the, the social media users used to get into trouble with the authorities for uh, misusing a certain word or uh, uh, breaking uh, a certain law by using a certain terminology or how they draft their posts. Now, with, this, with these statements coming from the Grand Mufti, we have seen a lot of uh, his followers actually using his statement to channel their feelings or how they feel about, let's say, normalizing relations with Israel, boycotting uh, French products after what happened in France, uh, and other uh, uh, aspects. So I think, in a way, it might not um, go exactly in line what, uh, with the statements that we've seen from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But on the other, uh, on the other hand, it is channeling and helping the public to express their uh, displeasance with a certain move or a certain step or announcement uh, on different uh, issues. Thank you, very interesting. Let's turn to uh, Yemen. Uh, we have a question from Eric Polovsky, uh, wondering uh, about the new Sultan's approach to the conflict, especially when the Biden administration takes over. In particular, how would the speakers rate the Sultan's influence with the Houthis? Um, and of course, uh, that's a, a live question now that we see the Trump administration might be looking to designate the organization as a terrorist organization. So Ambassador Sievers, do you wanna speak about Yemen? Sure. Um, I would say that I think broadly speaking, um, Sultan Haitham is, is taking a, a bit of a step back um, from a lot of the uh, regional issues that uh, Sultan Qaboos was very much involved in. It's not that there's any major change in Omani policy, but perhaps uh, uh, less focus on it as the country and the government focus very heavily on the economy and uh, the needs of uh, of uh, developing the economy and, and dealing with uh, uh, their fiscal situation and, and, and so forth. Um, all of that said, um, uh, Caboose had a, a certain uh, standing uh, with Yemen, uh, Yemen's parties uh, uh, across the board, uh, including the Houthis, but by no, no means limited to the Houthis. Uh, I, I don't know that uh, Sultan Haitham has, has been as uh, invested in, in uh, developing relationships in, uh, with, in, in Yemen, but I, I could be totally mistaken. I just don't know. On the designation issue, I do know that uh, the Omanis are, are very much against uh, designating the U.S. decision to designate the Houthis as a terrorist organization. Um, because I think they see that as uh, um, exacerbating the conflict, making it more difficult to, to settle it. Um, but also there's the question of uh, under US law, this idea of uh, material support, where uh, depending on how the, uh, um, the designation is, is crafted, even uh, contacts with, with the Houthis uh, or dialogue with them could be considered uh, material support for terrorism and therefore 
uh, subject to uh, to U.S. sanctions, and that would be one. It would be uh, uh, very difficult uh, for the Omanis to to go along with that and respect it. Um, uh, but secondly, it, it would make it uh, potentially uh, impossible for them to play the role that they've played over the last few years very successfully in arranging the uh, uh, the release and repatriation of. Uh, foreign hostages uh, seized by the Houthis in Yemen, um, which the uh, Omani authorities and uh, the royal office in particular have had great success and a, a wonderful record of being able to negotiate the release of these people and uh, working with, with us, uh, getting them home. They're not all Americans, but quite a number of them have been Americans. And that could become uh, very, very difficult, if not impossible. Uh, if uh, uh, we go ahead with this designation. Since we've talked about the role of uh, Omani mediation, maybe we can also address uh, perhaps changing relations with Iran. Uh, we had several questions from the audience. Uh, how do you assess from Huma Hudfar, how do you assess Oman political relations with Iran given new developments in the US and US-Iran relations, I guess, particularly under new Biden administration? Um, we had other questions as well, but but do you see uh, some kind of opening for Oman as, as the Biden administration looks to change its posture definitely towards uh, Iran, perhaps return to the JCPOA? Uh, I, you know, I think ever since President Trump uh, made the decision to leave the JCPOA, uh, and when I was still ambassador, the uh, Omani Ministry of Foreign Affairs and various other people uh, messaged me uh, fairly consistently that sooner or later uh, the United States would would uh, want to resume its dialogue with with Iran, uh, and that when that time came, if uh, Oman could contribute to that, they would be more than happy to do so. Uh, at the same time, they were very careful uh, to be in compliance with with U.S. sanctions, uh, including on on banking uh, and some of these uh, trade issues. Uh, which wasn't so easy for them, but I think they uh, they recognized the, uh, the difficulties that might ensue if, if they tried to challenge the U.S. I think they will be more comfortable uh, with the approach that we anticipate uh, uh, President Biden to take once he uh, assumes office. Um, but exactly uh, what uh, the thinking is in Washington about there are multiple potential channels. Uh, of course, the Swiss are our uh, diplomatic representatives in Tehran that represent U.S. interests. Uh, there is the Omani channel that, that's there potentially. Uh, the Japanese at times have uh, uh, tried to be involved in this, and so, so have the French. Um, so there, there's multiple potential channels. Uh, but I could certainly see that uh, should uh, uh, the new administration turn to Oman and ask for help, they would be more than happy to, uh, to try to do whatever they can. Um, we have a question from Anuj Swarup. Uh, will the new focus on the economic transformation open up opportunities for China? Um, so I guess Fatma, maybe you can take the lead on that. But of course the overall relationship uh, between Oman and China is of interest as well. Uh, yeah. Um, now, even with the changes in the economy and opening up the economy, um, Oman is not against Chinese investments, um, but they uh, they have Oman has its own way on attracting investments. Uh, they always want to maximize on what the investments get uh, uh, bringing to the table. Uh, what we've seen. Even even a uh, few years ago, when when China announced uh, the so-called ten billion uh, uh, city in in Dukum, um, to be honest, we haven't seen even a fraction of that coming to the country. Um, th so the concern is always the same: we are willing to give you le uh, very uh, affordable and cheap uh, land leases and use frac uh, agreements. We are willing to give you a competitive price when it comes to utilities, but in return, we demand a supply chain that helps the lo local economy. Um, we want uh, local vendors to start getting jobs, uh, to, to get some, some contracts. We want locals to have jobs. Uh, we, we require you to 
not exhaust the local uh, liquidity from the banks, but to bring your own money along with you. If these uh, uh, aspects are not fulfilled in the investments, so the, uh, at the end of the day, the country itself, the national economy does not gain much. And that is Oman's uh, stand. And I think it will continue to be the same stand. We are willing to give you uh, lands, uh, utility, gas, uh, uh, et cetera, but we want to see what is the added value you bring to the table? What is the added value in Oman that you are offering? So whether uh, uh, China or any other uh, invest, uh, invest, investors, if they do not fulfill these uh, uh, requirements for the Omani economy, I don't think that they will be moving um, very aggressively into Oman to invest in. Uh, because we've seen that the Chinese uh, model to invest in some countries where they bring their own labor, they bring their own vendors, they bring uh, all, almost all everything in the supply chain comes from China, but they only take utilities and liquidities from the banks uh, uh, where they are investing. And this is not something Oman wants to do. Uh, if they are to, to give money, so it is better to them to, to lend to local investors. But if international investors are coming, you are expected to bring uh, the cash with you. Okay, we had a, you, you mentioned the Tukum port, which obviously is very important uh, investment and uh, infrastructure project in Oman. Um, but we have a question that relates to Tukum port in terms of uh, foreign relations. And I think this is directed to you, Ambassador. With the UK investing and developing its military logistics and training presence in uh, the strategically significant port of Tukum and surrounding area, how do you see U.S. Uh, using its influence in this area, uh, particularly balancing assets outside of the Strait of Hormuz? Uh, and how do you think such a move would be seen by Oman? So it's a very specific question, but also just you can comment more broadly on uh, Oman relations with both the U.K. and, and the U.S. Sure, and I'd, I'd be interested in my Omani colleagues' uh, views on Dukum, more broadly speaking, too. But um, there is, you know, we negotiated, we the U.S. and, and Oman negotiated a framework agreement uh, to uh, develop the use of, of Dukum. Uh, uh, it also applies to Salala, but a, a lot of the attention was on Dukum because of its uh, important place in, in Oman's development plans uh, for the U.S. Navy, uh, much along the lines, the British were there ahead of us, um, but we had very, very similar uh, arrangements uh, that were agreed on uh, uh, in 2019. Um, it, during the uh, naval buildup of uh, the U.S. Navy in, in the Arabian Sea in the summer of 2019, uh, American aircraft carriers uh, uh, repeatedly uh, uh, went to Dukum for R&R uh, &R for the sailors and, and also for, uh, uh, for refueling. There's a, a dry dock there that, that's capable of, of performing uh, uh, repairs and, and other activities. Uh, and uh, as Fatima notes in terms of, of China, you know, the, the Oman was very keen in these negotiations and making sure that uh, any contracts uh, for uh, providing supplies and provisions uh, for the U.S. Navy would be with uh, Omani companies. Um, so that's, uh, that's part of that agreement, too. So we're there very much in, in the same uh, mode as the British, uh, but they've been there a little bit longer and they're a little bit uh, better established. Um, that's only the military side of the port. There, there is the, the civilian side that uh, uh, is still uh, still developing. I think initially because of the interest of some of the uh, Oman's uh, big partners in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, in Dukum as a, a, a naval facility, not a base, but uh, a place that uh, that our navies would have access. Um, that sort of got the priority. But of course, there's uh, big, big plans for the development of Dukum, both the civilian port and, and the industrial zones uh, and the city itself. So uh, um, uh, in terms of relations, uh, with U.S. and U.K., I think they're both very, very strong. 
I think post Brexit, uh, I don't want to speak for the British, but it certainly seems that they are focusing on a few places around the world where they have a special relationship and and trying to develop that further. I think Oman is one of those countries. Uh, and of course, uh, much of the Omani uh, elite has uh, longstanding connections to the UK and uh, many people uh, spend their summer vacations there and, and so forth. Uh, one, the US is a little farther away um, uh, and uh, perhaps not as, as longstanding a partner, but uh, relations with, with uh, all three countries uh, are very, very strong. I'll leave it there. Just a, a quick short follow-up question. Uh, and I do want to allow the um, our Amani panelists to comment on Dukum, but we had a question from Varsha Kurovaya just about how you assess Trump administration's Oman policy and, and is there a perception that Oman didn't receive the attention that it deserved um, amongst the Omani people? I guess anyone actually can answer that question. Um, I don't know. About uh, sorry, just to add to that. Also, if you could talk about how, what do you think the Biden administration should prioritize? Look, uh, there is a perception uh, that uh, the Trump administration downgraded relations with Oman. Um, it, it really isn't true. It, it um, uh, there were some issues at, uh, early on in the administration. Uh, and the, uh, um, the Riyadh summit uh, ha had some problems where uh, uh, the president's meeting with uh, uh, Syed Fahd uh, was canceled at the last minute. It was very, very embarrassing. Um, and uh, some other, other things that, that didn't quite come off. Um, I still, uh, I scrambled at that time to, to try to find out what was going on in the NSC and uh, ended up going back to Washington to see people. Uh, we worked on this very hard. Uh, Mike Pompeo was a, a big ally uh, in, in fixing that uh, aspect. And, and I think uh, within a few months, uh, uh, relations were, were uh, pretty much back where they had been. Um, but it's often the case that when a new administration comes in and uh, uh, changes policy, uh, they want to change uh, uh, the re approach to relations with some key countries associated with the policy. So I think there certainly were people in the Trump administration who, you know, sort of blamed Oman for its role in, in the JC, at least opening the channel to Iran that led to the JCPOA. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm certain that uh, with some time and effort, uh, we were able to, to, uh, to fix most of that, um, if, if not completely. Um, the Biden administration has a lot of people who were in the Obama administration. Uh, I think they will be looking very much to uh, going back to, to some of those policies. I think the uh, how to handle Iran and the JCPOA is going to be a challenge for them early on because uh, the, uh, the situation has changed. Uh, uh, Iran's non-compliance with the uh, restrictions under JCPOA is pretty far along, and uh, the Iranians may have very high expectations of what they can demand from uh, President Biden and his team. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how that all plays out, uh, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. So we're running uh, shorter on time. I want to let uh, both Turkey and Fatima get back into the conversation. Um, uh, we've had the issue of, of Dukum, which is a very important investment site, uh, obviously, and for the future of Oman. If either of you want to speak to that, that's, that's one option that I'll give to you either as position the economy or the public perception of what's happening in, in Dukum and that investment. Um, or if you want to comment as well on, on uh, these foreign relations. There was also a question thrown out though that I thought was interesting. Uh, someone noted, of course, that we have two journalists, Omani journalists on our panel. So they were wondering about the uh, future for freedom of expression in Oman uh, and how you see that uh, moving forward. So I'm going to allow the two of you to choose uh, which topic you want to address or, or a different topic altogether. Uh, but Fatma, go ahead. Uh, okay, I'll comment on Dokum and Turkey can comment on freedom of expression. How about that? 
You have a deal? Okay. Uh, so when it comes to DOCOM, yes, there has been a big focus on DOCOM to grow it as uh, the, the city of the future, to have a smart city, to have a lot of investments coming from everywhere, to have a certain participation to GDP. But we haven't seen that happening uh, on, on reality yet. Uh, the government has invested a lot when it comes to infrastructure, uh, billions when it comes to the ports, the dry dock, the roads, even the airport, but you do not have an anchor project yet. That anchor project is supposed to be the refinery and the petrochemical uh, complex. Now, that project is a joint venture, 50-50% between Oman and Kuwait. Unfortunately, due to um, the fallout of the pandemic, the complex itself has stopped. Yes, the refinery is still going uh, ahead, uh, with the se over 70% uh, construction completed, but the, comp the petrochemical complex itself uh, has been uh, put on hold. Now, that is a big drag for DOCOM to grow. Uh, a lot of people, even, even the society, they are relying on DOCOM to, have, to, to, uh, to, to provide a lot of jobs for, for Oman because it's a huge... Uh, city. It's supposed to be a new city from scratch. So it is expected to bring a lot of uh, demand for, for jobs. Uh, but because um, we, do not, we do not have any anchor project as of today, uh, we do not have the supply chain to support that anchor project. Uh, the major uh, project that we have there is the dry, uh, the dry port, uh, sorry, the dry dock and uh, the port. These two projects are yet to develop the supply chain that makes them compete uh, with our neighbors in, in the UAE that has also uh, a, uh, a dry dock and a major port. Um, we do not have the same uh, strength when it comes to the soft skills, the supply chain that to support or back the operations. And we do not have big projects like the refinery or the Chinese city or even uh, uh, other uh, promised projects to, to uh, create uh, clusters around them. And I think this is the main challenge that's facing DOCOM now. Yes, now with a unified authority, one authority promoting all the free zones and the special economic zones in the country, it should help at least to allocate what, which free zone to attract what sort of investments. And instead of the scattered uh, and overlap that Turkey mentioned uh, earlier, that each authority or each uh, head was to promote uh, his uh, baby or his free zone on a different uh, uh, page. But now if we, we with one unified authority, I think it should be smoother to allocate or at least classify each uh, zone to what sort of investments and what are the aims and goals for that. Turkey, it's to you. Okay, Turkey. Yeah, I invite you to talk, Turkey, about freedom of expression, but also uh, I know we've talked before about the shifting role of media more generally or the receptivity of the government to that. So if you could comment on that as well, it'd be great. Yeah, we have noticed, you know, last few months there was, uh, I think, uh, uh, still, I mean, we can't, you know, give a very panoramic view on how media could change in Oman uh, without seeing change in the laws, actually, because laws play very big role on uh, controlling media. So, but I think uh, there is a chance now for media in Oman to play a different role, I, I think, because we have a new Sultan and people are looking really for more uh, changes in the media, how they are dealing with the topics and the issue as being rise with the, within the society, especially there is also many young uh, people who are writing and criticizing and you know, rise and question the social media, that could be also a very good uh, way to interact with what have been, you know, uh, rise in social media. But uh, we have to mention as well that media were uh, being um, targeted last uh, few years in a month. Few online newspaper and printed newspaper, and many journalists, a few journalists and many activists were in jail, you know, for uh, last few years. But I think this is also a good uh, um, time to test also how the uh, new government is dealing with the freedom of speech. And if we are seeing the new basic law, 
it's mentioned as well that all media are uh, have the right to share and to express uh, you know, but but as well, we are waiting to see what kind of uh, change that could happen in the laws. And I think this is the time for media to take a step to test the water as well and to see if really we are having the real or at least the changes where we are looking for from now. Great. Well, I think with that, our, our time is up. So I want to thank all of our uh, panelists for, wow, their well-informed uh, participation and and candor and approaching all of these topics. Um, it's been only one year since Sultan Haytham came, came to power. Uh, we've already seen a lot of changes, so we'll be very eager to, to watch and see what happens uh, with the Sultan and with the Oman and his population moving forward. So thank you. Thank you to all of you. And, and thank you as well for our, um, a really great audience. I, I tried to get to as many questions as I could, and there were many excellent ones that were left. But uh, I hope that you've uh, drawn as much from this panel as I have. So thank you to all of you.